Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so first of all, I'm really sorry I haven't done a video in a while. I've been super busy, okay, but I have been paying attention to the Sarah Boone trial, and today I'd like to do a little update on basically how I kind of am assessing uh, the quality of the defense and what I would maybe predict as an outcome, although I want to be very careful. This case is very difficult. All right. Anyway, so I have been following this trial, um, and I, I'd first like to respond to a couple of things. I saw on a couple other YouTube channels, okay, Dr. Grande and I think Harvard Lawyer Lee, and basically everybody was really surprised that the, that the defense rejected, that the defense turned down the state's um, manslaughter uh, plea deal, okay? There was a plea offer, uh, you know, I think it was 15 years with manslaughter, and basically everyone was saying how stupid that was to turn that down, okay? Now, first of all, Okay, I do believe Sarah is guilty. Okay, I believe she's guilty. And in fact, I think she's guilty of more than what she's charged with, to be quite honest. All right. However, I think that if I were defending her now, I may not defend her the way James Owens does. Okay, but still, I probably would also have turned down the 15 year uh, manslaughter. So I'll try to explain everything. But before I assess what I think of her defense, okay, and how I think her defense team is doing, and they're doing very good, by the way, I'm going to be very honest, okay, before I get into that, I'd first like to try to explain what I think really happened and what I really think uh, Sarah Boone is guilty of, and then why I still would have turned down the plea offer for 15 years. What about that evening sticks out to you? The that sticks out to me from that night was literally just the loud there was a very very loud noise that i heard that was loud and powerful enough to shake my bedroom wall and i literally felt the wall shake so i could hear something that start above me super loud and then fall away from me at like like it was falling down the stairs. Okay, guys, this is what I was afraid of. Okay, I mentioned this in other videos. If you want to see my early videos, I mentioned that if I were evaluating this case, okay, and if I was like, say, consulting Sarah herself, okay, the first thing I would tell her is that regardless of what really happened, okay, I need to know the quality of the evidence of any neighbors who might have heard some noises, okay, around the time of whatever the suitcase incident, right? OK, and here we have it. This is the worst case scenario, I think, for the defense. OK, so um, none of us know what happened. None of us know what happened. OK, but these are two roommates, OK, who are relatively sober, relatively healthy compared to someone like Sarah, who's a chronic alcoholic. And as we'll see later, she's a chronic liar. She knows how to lie about domestic violence when she has to. OK. And these guys have no, they have nothing to gain or lose. Um, they're just, you know, they're not as invested in the outcome of this case. Okay. And both of them tell almost the same story, exactly what I was afraid of, always have been afraid of. Okay. When I heard about all the injuries to Jorge's body, okay, way back before this trial, okay, my main concern was that the only way that could happen is if this, the suitcase came tumbling down the staircase, right? That was always my concern. Okay. And with those two pieces of evidence, okay, I would have to tell Sarah, look, we can do whatever you want to do, okay, but just understand how dangerous it will be, okay, if you try to uh, create a theory that kind of uh, avoids what may have happened with the suitcase going down the stairs, right, that could be very dangerous because if the judge thinks you're lying, okay, that could affect you at sentencing. You pay a price at sentencing if the if the judge thinks you're lying if you're going to testify on your own behalf and this risk is actually compounded because it's not just the judge who's going to punish her if it seems like she's not telling the truth but also the jury the jury will also punish her if they feel she's not telling the truth okay and this is i think the most important part of the trial at least in terms of her credibility check this out we don't have to call an ambulance if you could just take me just i'll drive whatever i can do please to go to the hospital for this and he said that before anything happens i had to concoct a story in order for him to not be arrested or be in trouble when we did inevitably get to the hospital so I'm sitting there with this blood soaked towel with blue lips, trying to come up with a story of what I can tell them when I go down there so he's not in trouble and telling him that it's okay. And I came up with the, the story of that we were sword fighting silly after drinking with our steak knives and he accidentally punctured my leg. 
Okay, so let's not pretend any of us really know exactly what happened either on that night or on the night of the suitcase, okay? None of us should pretend we actually know what happened. None of us know what happened. However, look at this. That testimony, okay, she is showing a perfect pattern, okay? And this is important to see Jorge told her to think up the story, right? So she's the one making up the story. It wasn't that Jorge made a story that they were sword fighting. He just said, hey, make it up. And then she made up a story. So she's the one, Sarah's the one who has a pattern of taking a domestic incident and then making a weird sort of funny story about it where it seems like they're just playing games, okay? This is exactly parallel to how did Jorge get in the suitcase that we were playing hide and seek, right? Playing hide and seek. That tells me, or that gives me a huge question that maybe Jorge didn't get into the suitcase the way she says he got in the suitcase, okay? So if that's true, and if hide and seek is not on the table, then why shouldn't I believe her neighbors even more, okay? Why shouldn't I give more credibility to her neighbors, okay? So then the question is, you know, it looks like Jorge probably got in the suitcase upstairs, not downstairs, and maybe it wasn't hide and seek, okay? Maybe Sarah was basically just kind of joking with him and, you know, saying, hey, that's, you know, I wonder if you're flexible enough to get, you know, kind of playing with his ego to see if maybe he would try to get in the suitcase. And then somehow she zipped it up. And then suddenly some sadistic thing came out of Sarah, you know. And so then the next question is, is there anything in her evidence that shows that maybe she's sadistic, right? And that, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. And it didn't take long for her and her testimony to show, I think, really strong signs of sadistic uh, tendencies or, you know, sadism. Why did you want to come in? I felt that George needed a change of scenery. I was trying to encourage him to call his family. I decided to continue to maintain and focus him. And I have a bunch of paints that I used of my son's. Okay, so I think we make a mistake when we get too focused on what we think is her narcissism, okay? Obviously, she's a little bit narcissistic and she's very haughty and superior. Okay, and she sounds very snotty and snooty in these in these little clips. Okay, but we avoid maybe focusing so much on the narcissism, we we forget to look at maybe some other things. Okay, um, she is very condescending. Okay, in the way she regards Jorge, she thinks of Jorge. She says it like a little kid because she wants to direct his attention. She says, and she's going to offer him like you know painting the the same paints that she uses for her children, right? So that's a way of her leaking out that she basically thinks of Jorge like as a child, okay? So that's a very condescending, superior way to look at him. But leaving aside the narcissism, okay, if you look at where, where she says earlier, oh, I thought he needed a change of scenery, okay? She's assuming a lot of control over this guy, okay? Now, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, okay? But to me, when someone is has an excessive amount of control over another person, it just... It just comes out naturally. They just assume that they have a ton of control over another person. I see that as like a sign of sadism, okay? Because to me, sadism is not just the enjoyment of hurting people. I think to me, sadism has a lot to do with dominating other people, okay? I think it has a lot to do with dominating other people. And when someone just naturally assumes they have like complete control over another person, that that person is basically subordinated to them as though they were just a child, that tells me um, that, you know, that at least at least sadism, sadism is on the table here. Y'all came in to call relatives, call family. No, I had him call outside. OK, so here you can really, really see it. OK, because she's supposed to have all this rapport with her own attorney. OK, and so as she's describing how dominant and controlling is, she is with Jorge, she's actually very disagreeable with her own attorney who's trying to kind of, you know, keep sort of a smooth flow in the questioning. And she's like, no, nope, no. Nope. I sent him outside. So at the same time as she's describing this like dominant control over Jorge, she's sort of dominating and correcting her attorney at the same time. It's all very subconscious. And I'm not pretending to be a professional, but I think everything in her demeanor is telling me that her like dominance, her dominance level is way, way high. Okay. And so to me, the main indicator of sadism is really excessive dominance, you know, excessive overbearing dominance. Okay. And what's even more interesting is she, I think she thinks she's making herself look good with the way she's telling the story. And she has no idea that she comes across as being way, way too dominant and uh, kind of condescending with people. Right. So this is where I think you can see really mental illness, because I think she thinks that she looks good the way she's describing this situation. Anybody else will look at her and say she seems like toxic and pathological in the way she's like over dominant and really sadistic with Jorge.
Okay, so with all that in mind, okay, what do I think really happened? Okay, and then why do I think she's getting a good defense? And why do I think they should have, they should have rejected the 15 year manslaughter offer? Okay, that sounds like it doesn't add up, but I'm going to try to explain. Okay, this is what I think happened. All right. I think number one, I think Sarah is very dissociated. Okay, I think her the different parts of her personality are very fragmented and dissociated. What does that mean? This happens a lot with narcissistic people. Okay, why is it that she can believe that she's some really upstanding, straight A, perfect person, but in reality, she's really kind of a monster? How, how is she able to have that kind of like split out? It's like her personality is like fragmented, okay? Like, like the parts of her that are really kind of prim and intelligent, they're sort of like dissociated or divorced from the other parts of her that are like monster. Okay, basically, right? So Sarah is a person who's not in touch with the actual monster. The monster is there, but she's not in touch with it. So I think, I think Sarah was enjoying the night. I think Sarah was enjoying whatever she was doing with Jorge that night. And I think even when she manipulated him to get into the suitcase, I think she was probably enjoying herself, okay, to some extent, right? But I think that dissociated, sadistic part of her, like the monster, monster part of her, it's always there, okay? And so it's going to influence her subconsciously. So I think that subconsciously, I think her motive of getting him in the suitcase was to dominate the hell out of him, right? On some primal level, okay? So once she zipped it up, okay, and she knew that she was safe and, she, and that he couldn't fight back, I think she got a rise and she got a high out of knowing, hey, I have control over this guy. And all the memories she had, all the memories of all the abuse and all the memories of, of the way she's built up all the frustration with Jorge, she finally had an opportunity to really sort of get at him and sort of let him have it in a way that maybe she couldn't have done, you know, when Jorge was, was able to defend himself, right? So she had a unique opportunity to have him very, very vulnerable, right? And I think the primal sadistic thing just came out of her. All right. I don't think there had to be any um, there didn't have to be any trigger for it. Right. Because I think she's always carrying it. Right. And she's already drunk. So her inhibitions are going down. And so I think the natural subconscious um, monster that she carries, that, that's that she cannot she cannot own it, it's sort of divorced from her. But it's always there subconsciously. I think it just surged out of her at an opportunity when she had the opportunity to finally have control over Jorge and Jorge couldn't fight back. So I don't think they were playing hide and seek, or at least I don't think the hide and seek was the way she said. OK, and I really don't think they were playing hide and seek. I think that's the same as when she made up the, the thing about the sword fighting. I think she just made that up. Right. I think they were messing around upstairs. They probably were playing around upstairs. I think she probably did manipulate him to get into the suitcase. OK. And I think she probably tumbled the suitcase with him in it, okay, upstairs and probably thought to herself, hey, I'll get him near the staircase, all right? And then I think she just tossed him down the stairs. I think, I think that was how much of a monster and how much rage she had building up inside. And I think it was all very spontaneous. I don't think there had to be a trigger because their relationship, it was a buildup over months and months or however much time where she had a lot to be upset about. And especially the monster part of her had a lot to be kind of, you know, kind of uh, building up a lot of resentment towards Jorge, but a resentment that she could not feel because that's part of her monster. That's not really part of her. Okay. It's like a broken off part of her. And I think it just surged out when she had the opportunity. And I think she threw him down the staircase. That would explain why the neighbors heard what they heard. Okay. And it was probably very loud. And I think Jorge got beaten up as he went down the stairs. I think he probably, that's probably how he got all the bruises on his hands and his back or whatever. And so I think that explains a lot. Now, did she later take a baseball bat and hit the, hit the suitcase? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't, you know, um, maybe she talked about it with her lawyer and, you know, maybe they talked about it hypothetically. You know, the lawyer would say, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what happened. The lawyer can't do that. Right. But let's just say the lawyer would say, look, let's just say the neighbors are right. OK, or let's just say the jury believes the neighbors. Right. Let's say the jury believes the neighbors. How are we going to deal with him going down the stairs? And this is exactly where Sarah's mental illness causes a problem with her defense. OK, because Sarah, again, she's totally dissociated from the monster in herself. She can't bear to own the monster. She can't. She just can't do it. She'll do the opposite. So. Even if the lawyer brings up hypothetically, what are we going to do if the jury believes that he went down the stairs? Okay, her denial will be in full force. And she'll say that did not happen. She'll say they misunderstood because Jorge beat me up and he dragged me down the stairs on another day. 
and Sarah will insist that the neighbors have it wrong. Okay. And the neighbors are remembering the wrong day and everybody is wrong, but she will not own that she possibly put him down the stairs. She just will not own that. And so we might think it's because Sarah's like some kind of mastermind and she's trying to avoid, let's say, a more serious charge. And she's like thinking like a lawyer, like, oh, she's calculating. Well, then I would be guilty of attempted first degree murder if I sent him down the stairs. You know, I don't think she's thinking so, so calculatedly. I don't think it's that calculated. I think this is where the mental illness comes in, because regardless of the fact that it is a more serious crime, yes, I mean, it could even be kidnapping with tor with the equivalent of torture, like kidnapping with great bodily harm, which in, in Florida is like a first degree felony. So even it could be like attempted first degree murder, it could be kidnapping with great bodily harm, and it could just be all these terrible felonies. But I think just deep down inside, she knows that would make her look more like a monster, right? And I think that's what holds her back. I think more than just the fact that she may have calculated that there are more felonies she could be charged with, right? So I personally think this is where the mental illness gets in the way of her defense. Okay. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Also, it'll make her look like way more of a liar. Okay. She already looks like a liar. Okay. But the way she's telling the story now, it's like, yeah, I lied about a few things, but I was telling the truth about the hide and seek and all this stuff. Well, if she tells the real truth, she would look like a complete liar. Okay. So I think there are a lot of psychological reasons why she just cannot own the real story. And this is why I think James Owens and his defense team are doing an excellent job representing Sarah Boone. I think they're doing a fantastic job, actually. Okay. I know there's been a lot of fireworks, but they have to fight. They have to fight. Okay. And the reason is, and let me try to explain this. It's a little difficult, but James Owens doesn't have a choice. Okay. Why? Because in the United States, for some reason, and this is just historical, the United States uh, criminal procedure law has been very, very poor in integrating accommodations for mental illness. OK, let's just be honest. Right. OK. As we all know, just people who don't even, don't even know the law, even non-lawyers know that the only way you can get meaningful, meaningful defenses on mental health grounds, OK, into a criminal case. All right is only when you're dealing with super, super severe mental illness where a person is not even aware they're doing right or wrong or are in very special extreme uh, situations. Like for example, if you actually have a battered spouse, okay, but battered spouse only works if you're actually in a situation that would be equivalent to real self-defense, okay? So we don't allow in the United States a situation where someone can have dissociative sadism right? Dissociated sadism. Okay. So that they don't need a real trigger, right? Where they just, they, they can just spontaneously be overcome by an impulse to do something sadistic because of a buildup and because of a battered spouse situation, right? If the United States were a little more flexible and open to allow real things that can really happen. Okay. Well, that's just not possible in today's state of the law. The, the, the law in many ways in the United States is kind of backwards. It's kind of we're kind of like behind by maybe a few, not even decades, we're probably behind almost by a century in terms of the sophistication of how criminal procedure deals with mental, real life mental illness, not just at the extremes. Okay. So um, Mr. Owens doesn't have a, a choice. Okay. And also here's the other problem. The, the client has a psychological reason for not being able to have a, a better defense. Okay. Or be more honest in her defense. Right. And so her psychology is getting in the way of Mr. Owens giving her the right kind of uh, representation, right? It's, it's because of her psychology, but we don't have a system in the United States where attorneys can have like a psychologist in the middle sort of mediating to provide a defense to people where you can prove that their mental illness is actually interfering with their Sixth Amendment right, okay, to effective assistance of counsel, all right? So now, I mean, it sounds beautiful, right? We have a we have a constitutional amendment. OK, it's in the Constitution that every defendant will have meaningful and effective assistance of counsel. And yet we only allow, like, say, people to be declared, like, say, incompetent, you know, to stand trial if they're just so whacked out psychotic that they can't even sit there right next to their next to their attorney and just even understand what's going on. Right. And yet it is true that with certain types of personality disorders, with certain types of dissociative or dissociated 
fragmented personalities where a person cannot even own the worst parts of themselves. Okay. That means that they cannot integrate reality, parts of reality that would help them build an effective defense or a meaningful defense. Right. And it's because of their psychology that they cannot work with their lawyer to get the sixth amendment right to effective assistance of counsel. So in my opinion, okay, Sarah has a condition that's not psychotic. She's not psychotic, but she has dissociative personality issues. Okay. And it may be from trauma. It may be from some kind of, I don't know, some kind of uh, complex PTSD. I don't know what it is, but she has a lot of dissociation and that dissociation means she can't own parts of herself. Okay. And so that means she can't own parts of the truth. And because she can't own parts of the truth, she cannot meaningfully help her attorney give her effective assistance of counsel. So she has a psychological condition that is not psychotic, that is preventing her from getting what the Constitution says she should get as as a defendant in terms of a defense. OK, and I don't, I don't know if I don't know if uh, James Owens is processing it the same way I'm processing it. But I think James Owens knows that she's not going to own things that probably even he thinks are true right? That she's not able to go there. And so he's forced to mount a different type of defense, which is the defense that's based on the idea that maybe the suitcase never came down the stairs and all this other stuff happened with the baseball bat and that the hand came out of the suitcase and that, that frightened uh, Sarah. And that was the trigger to allow her to have the better, the battered spouse. So I don't think James Owen has a choice. Okay. And yet if he does nothing, Okay, and he doesn't. If he doesn't give her any defense, then she's even worse off. So I think we have a hole in the way our constitutional criminal procedural law is applied in the United States. I think at some point we will either become more flexible and more enlightened in the way we integrate real life mental illness, not just at the extremes. Okay, otherwise we're just going to be backwards in that part of the law. So why do I think the defense team is doing an excellent job in this case? Okay, even though we know we know the case is basically BS and it's an artificial case not based on the truth. And we know why we know why, because in the United States, we don't have a good accommodation for the real life mental illness. Okay, so James Owens has no choice but to go with an artificiality. Okay, so the defense is a little bit BS. It's an artificial defense, but there's no choice. Okay, but why is the defense team doing an excellent job? In my opinion, it has to do with sentencing, sentencing. OK, in my opinion, um, they have no choice but to go forward with the battered, battered wife syndrome. Do I think it's because she's really a battered wife? Well, actually, I actually I think she is a battered wife. But is it, is it because I think she really was in a self-defense situation? No, the self-defense part is artificial. OK, the battered wife is probably somewhat real, somewhat real. The self-defense is not real, okay? But with this artificial defense, what are they getting out of it, okay? What they're getting out of it is they're getting all this information for free into the trial so that at sentencing, at sentencing, they'll be set up to go below the guidelines, below the minimums, okay? And that's why I would not accept 10 year, 15 years, I would not accept a 15-year offer on manslaughter. I would not accept that because even second-degree murder you can get pretty close to 15 years under the guidelines. OK, so there's really no no motivation because, look, regardless of what we think of the truth of what really happened or how bad Sarah is, we cannot deny she has a lot of psychological stuff going on combined with the alcoholism. And in my opinion, I think you could even find an expert to say she has mental deterioration because of all the years of, of doing alcohol. So I think there is room to argue, you know, she has su such a substantial psychological history and condition that we can go below the guidelines for sentencing. Okay, so that's why I would not accept the, the plea deal from the state. So given all that, what is my prediction for this trial? All right, now let's keep in mind, nobody can actually predict a trial. There's always some uncertainty with every jury, so nobody will know for sure, but this is my prediction, okay? My prediction is that they may get a hung jury. They may get a hung jury, okay? And the jury may hang on whether it should be second degree murder, okay? Now the jury may be unanimous on manslaughter, right? And why do I say that? Because now there's all this information that Sarah and Jorge had a very abusive and physically violent and really chaotic and toxic relationship, right? OK, whether you want to call her a battered spouse, whether you want to say that it was really self-defense. Now the jury has gotten to see so much of the reality of that relationship, OK, that it could take 
the the mental state down a notch from the mental state required for second degree murder. Okay, second degree murder requires an absolute disregard for human life, right? Whereas um, manslaughter just requires regular recklessness, right? And so what is that difference between total disregard for human life and recklessness? Okay, I, I, I would argue that that little difference, okay, in the mental state could be accommodated by the fact that she was dealing with so much built up resentment and rage at being abused by Jorge. Now, I understand they both abused each other. So let's, let's be realistic. But there, there was abuse coming her way as well. OK, so given all that history, I think a reasonable juror could say, look, I'm just not comfortable with the mental state for second degree murder, but I am comfortable with the regular reckless mental state for manslaughter. So I'm thinking the jury might hang on second degree murder, but the jury could be unanimous on uh, on manslaughter. Right. OK, so I'm not sure if that would come out as a total hung jury because that could be a lesser included. The, the manslaughter could be a lesser included of the second degree. But I'm pretty sure that if it was just second degree murder, I think a jury might hang on second degree murder. So that's the the second benefit. It's not that they're going to uh, acquit her. OK, and I don't even think James Owens really thinks they're going to get an acquittal. I just think he's getting enough information in through the battered spouse defense that it could cause a jury to hang on second degree and put them in the slot for manslaughter. And then if they could get manslaughter, then at sentencing, they could really work with, like, say, a below guidelines departure using a ton of uh, psychological experts to just really reinforce a realistic assessment of Sarah's actually actual psychological and neurological condition. OK, we'll see if they actually are able to do that. But that's basically my prediction. And if it's not my prediction, a little bit of that is maybe how I would do it if, if I were if I were on the defense team. Um, I can tell you, you know, I'll, I'll bet you James Owens might even disagree with me or maybe they're not thinking about it. But if I was on the defense team, I would hire a neurologist, not just a psychiatrist, but a neurologist to examine her actual brain functioning. OK, and then to see if you could get somebody to, to issue an opinion that maybe she has degraded neurological functioning, probably as a result of decades of alcohol abuse. So, you know, that's how I would do that anyway. So my prediction is um, now I can't guarantee it. OK, but I, I think there's a good chance the jury will not convict her on second degree murder. I think there's a good chance they'll fall down to a manslaughter if that's allowed. And if the, and if they get jury instructions that allow a lesser included as far as sentencing, if if she gets a manslaughter. OK, I think um, she'll probably get right around the bottom of the guidelines or maybe just a little bit lower if they can present good psychiatric and neurological uh, evidence at sentencing. Now, if she does get second degree murder, um, that will be one hell of a difficult sentencing, OK, because she'll start at a higher minimum. But if, but if they do get a departure, I think it'll only be if they get extensive neurological and psychiatric evidence at, at sentencing. So that's basically my my prediction. And I do think the defense team is doing an excellent job. That's that's my honest opinion. So anyway, sorry, I'm not putting out a lot of videos. I've been so busy, but I do want to get more videos out. Um, I'm, I really am interested in these videos. And uh, just appreciate your patience and thanks for watching.